Aloha and welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. It's a show dedicated to providing up-to-date information news to Hawaii home buyers, sellers, and investors. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner, and wife, Leonie Lam, a realtor with over 20 years of experience in leadership roles in the Hawaii real estate industry. Thanks, Will. Will is a full-time realtor sharing his talents as a lawyer, a law school professor, and the former head of a Hawaii title and escrow company. Together as a full-time husband and wife realtor team, our mission is to bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. So today we're talking about a big question. Should you rent or should you buy? And so how do people build wealth within home ownership? Well, we all work hard, especially here in Hawaii. And so how do we leverage our income to build wealth? How do tax deductions and exemptions increase your wealth? We are so grateful to have Tabitha Mitchell, certified public accountant, and HARPTA specialist, an incredibly seasoned property investor with us. We're going to be talking all about property taxes, deductions and exemptions, renting versus buying is the main topic, um, tax benefits in real estate, and government-backed mortgages, and mortgage interest. All right, Tabitha, and, and we're going to also talk about the NAR uh, commission and the new practice changes as well. So we're going to throw that in. So Tabitha Mitchell, she's the owner of Tax Filings LLC and HARPTA Support Hawaii. Over 20 years of CPA experience as an audit director with, with an international public accounting firm in Singapore and of course here in Hawaii, especially if you're a non-resident owner. So you reside on the mainland or in a foreign country. When you sell your home, 7.25% of the sales price may be withheld and sent to the Hawaii State Tax Department at closing. So what Tabitha does, so she focuses on helping mainland and foreign sellers with applying for a refund to get as much of those money back. So welcome, Tabitha. Thank you so much, Will and Leone. I'm really happy to be on this discussion with you in your Inside Hawaii Real Estate show. Okay, so let's get started. So the American dream have always included owning your own home. So the ultimate question is, you know, should you rent? Should you buy? And what are your real thoughts? Okay, let's start off like quick little fun fact here. So 90 years ago, most Americans did not own their own home. Actually, you had to put down 50 to 100% on the purchase price of a home. So, you know, most middle class and definitely the lower class could not afford that. And so during the 1930s, um, the Great Depression, a lot of people were struggling. People were going through foreclosure. So the government stepped in and the government actually started offering mortgages that were insured and subsidized by them. And what it did is created more opportunities for Americans to purchase their own homes and therefore become like the American dream of the create fulfillment. So what these mortgages were typically, it was about 30 years as it is now. And so during those 30 years, now homeowners also incurred mortgage interest because they have this loan they have on their house instead of buying it outright with cash. And so now they have mortgage interest for 30 years. And what is great about mortgage interest is that it is completely tax deductible. It's a dollar for dollar tax deduction. So see, so every dollar of mortgage interest that you incur and pay, you reduce your taxable income by that same dollar. Um, so just as an example, so the Honolulu Border Builders July single family home medium median sales price was about $1.1 million. So you put down 20% down, and you get a mortgage for that 80%. That's about $900,000. Um, with the average interest rate at 7%, you would have like mortgage interest of about like $63,000. So that $63,000, um, it's a lot. But what it does is that $63,000 that you pay in mortgage interest, you can, when you file your tax returns, you can reduce your taxable income by that $63,000. And there's there's no phase out on that deduction, which is like super beneficial. The mortgage interest, like, you know, when it comes to home buyers, they're often, especially like in the last couple of years, right? We've been having turbulent mortgage interest rates. Yeah. But, you know, they're leveling off right now, like a little mm -hmm. bit softening, probably about 6.5%, you know, at the moment, and then you can get it down lower. But in, what you're saying is that for mortgage interest rates, like even if you're paying a high, the, the higher interest rate, the better from a tax perspective, because then it offsets whatever income that you're getting. So you're working hard, you're getting a paycheck. If you own property, 
you take and you have a mortgage, then that interest, whatever it is that you're paying, and it could be, you know, on a median single family house, like up to 63000 in a year, then you're able to offset whatever it was that you earned. So then you pay less taxes. Correct. Yes. That's exactly it. Pay less taxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we all strive to do. Pay less taxes. So the mortgage interest deduction provides that benefit. I mean, you pay less taxes, but you have to pay your mortgage. Um, but at least you get the ben benefit for paying something that you want instead of taxes. Tabitha, so you know, with regards to this mortgage interest rate deductions, so whether you're a full-time employee, you're a business owner, it doesn't matter. They, they don't discriminate, right? I mean, this applies to everyone and anyone who owns a home. Correct. Yes. Anybody that owns a home and has mortgage interest can take the deduction. Um, the only time that it may be where you don't take the mortgage interest deduction is where your standard deduction is more than the mortgage interest. Because mortgage interest is itemized, is an itemized deduction, and you can either take mortgage interest, I mean, I'm sorry, you can either take an itemized deduction or you can take a standard deduction. You can't do both. So depending on which one is higher in your situation, in your own individual situation, depends on which deduction you would take. So the bottom line is, you know, when it comes to the ultimate question of renting versus buying, if you're renting, I mean, is there any tax benefits if you're a renter? No. So all that rent that you pay every month, that you don't get any tax benefit from it. Yeah, so in that situation, that taxpayer would take the standard deduction because they don't have any itemized deductions, such as mortgage interest, to that would be beneficial to them. So that's one point for home ownership is that you get the mortgage interest deduction versus renting, you get no tax deduction for renting. And then I think like when you're renting, there's a certain comfort though because you're not having to pay maintenance costs typically right all of that is kind of included in your rent sometimes utilities could be included so you're paying like a lower potentially monthly cost perhaps however i think something to consider is that there's a lack of flexibility um sometimes because you don't have control so like we had a situation where us we had some sellers that needed to sell a property that had tenants living there for they've been living there for a long time with their family you know with a mother-in-law and kids mm -hmm. and then they were given notice that you know seller needs to sell and so they had a time frame that they had to figure out where they were going to go live and it was really tough for mm -hmm. them and you know they're more motivated than ever i think now at this point to actually buy a home so that they don't have to go through that process it can be super emotional it's tough you know to figure out where you're going to go you have a certain time frame to find a, a place that you you can accommodate everyone and so i think the flexibility is lacking when you're renting, mm -hmm. so that's another reason for homeowning versus renting. Yes, definitely flexibility for a renter is a pro because you can move anytime you want as well. But it's also a negative because your landlord can decide to sell anytime that they want as well. That is a half a point here, half a point there. <laughs> but like you mentioned, I think control. Yes, so as a homeowner, you have complete control over your property. You know, you can have pets, you can have the most magnificently hideous yellow wall as an accent piece in your house. You can do whatever you want in your own home and it's all controlled by you as a homeowner. Versus if you rent, and this is a personal situation that I, I fell into, is that when I, I wanted my child to go into a certain district school and it was really difficult to get a GE into that school. So what I decided, I owned a home, but I decided I'm gonna rent that out and I'm going to rent a house in that school district. So they, they, they have to accept my child. So when, but that rental, it had the tiniest, oldest washer and dryer like I've ever seen in my whole entire life. And so like having a four-year-old and an infant at the time, I was used to washing a, you know, a load a day, a, a load a day. And so I asked the landlord, I'm like, hey, can I replace the washer and dryer? And the landlord, she's like, no, why? And I was like, um, because I, you know, I'll pay for it. And she's like, no, I was like, I'll leave it. When I move out, I will leave the washer and dryer for you, like as a gift. And she's still like, no. 
And I don't know why. I still don't understand why she didn't want to free washer and dryer for her rental. But I lost, I did not have any control of the type of washer and dryer that I wanted in my living situation. And so I had no control as a renter. It's just a, oh, and my son did get into the school, of course. <laughs> Happy ending to that story. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So for the most part, I mean, anyone who's renting now, if at all possible, if, I mean, with, you know, I, I know there's some, well, we'll see what the political landscape is going to be, you know, mm-hmm. next year after this November, um, there's there's some discussions about uh, $25,000 to first time home buyers for down payment assistance. I mean, that sounds pretty awesome. Uh, but especially in Hawaii, even with the 25000 you know, it's very limited on what you could buy. So in terms of buying, I mean, is there any, uh, in those situations, I mean, should they just sacrifice everything possible to buy a home? Or is there any, you know, negatives, concerns on tr- trying to, you know, push everything possible to to buy a home versus just continuing to rent? Okay, so... I just want to mention the new legislature or, or new, you know, the election. So I just want to um, discuss really quickly the tax okay. credits and job act. So that was signed into law by actually Donald Trump back in 2017. And what it provided was like a complete overhaul of tax changes that we have not seen in like three decades. And a lot of the tax changes related to related to things that dealt with home ownership. And so but it was also temporary tax changes. So it was only a tax changes that would be in place from 2018 through 2025. And right now it's set to expire unless, not that I wanna discuss anything political, Donald Trump comes into office, he says that he will make it permanent. But what it did is it increased the standard, the tax cut and job, increased the standard deduction for everyone. It doubled it, it actually doubled it. Um, but what it does is because the standard deduction was doubled, now when you compare it against itemized deductions, how we talked about mortgage interest, when we compare it against itemized deductions, you can either take the standard deduction or the itemized deduction. And so by doubling the standard deduction, he actually created less tax um, benefits for people that own their homes because now everybody would take the standard deduction and not have to worry about the mortgage interest deduction. But that is gonna set to expire in 2025. So the standard deduction in 2026 is gonna drop back down to, um, you know, it could be like $13,000 or whatever it is adjusted um, for inflation back from the 2017 rate. And then when that drops back down, what people are going to find out that people that own their own homes and have the mortgage interest deduction again, that itemize their deductions is going to, it's going to again, create a bigger tax savings for them by taking the itemized deduction. And uh, besides the itemized deductions, there's also other uh, mortgage interest deduction. There's also like real estate, real property taxes that you can take as well as state income taxes. And also I know there's a lot, but, also, in 2026, you'll be allowed to take a deduction on that HELOC that you may have opened up like a few years ago. Um, so that also will be deductible again. Okay, Are so I'm gonna put you. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna put you on. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna put you on the spot. Okay, so the ultimate question is from a pure tax standpoint, not picking Democrats or Republicans, but from a pure home ownership standpoint. Which one is more beneficial? Which plan? Is it the Democratic plan or the Republican plan? Just from a pure tax standpoint as a homeowner. So no matter what people say during the elections, what they do during once they are elected can differ. And so therefore, I don't usually put my cards on what people say. I put my cards into, okay, when they're elected, what are they actually doing? And then that way I can decide, okay, well, was it the right choice or not? And, but the thing with taxes is that you're always going to have tax, you know, benefits of certain tax and some people is going to have worse off, but all you have to do is continue to analyze what the tax changes are, restructure yourself to then take advantage of any changes that you can 
any changes that will benefit you. So I think it's not Republican versus Democrat, but it's just like, like you also said, is that you look at all the taxes and you structure your life in order to create the most advantageous use of those tax benefits offered by the government. And that's where you can talk to your CPA for your tax strategy. Kind of a follow-up question to that is when you're saying to kind of, you know, watch the different whatever tax rules or new laws that are coming out, like, what are you watching? Because, I mean, sometimes media, like, you know, I don't really always trust whatever they <laughs> say or, you know, the way it's presented. So I'm just kind of wondering, mm -hmm. like, from a CPA's perspective, what, what are you looking at when you're tracking changes within tax law and the government and, and things like that? So one really good website is a nonprofit, um, the Tax Foundation. So the Tax Foundation, they, 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 they put out content all the time, um, and they do their own analysis and reporting. Um, and so I look at that to determine what tax changes are on the horizon for each candidate, as well as any changes that are, you know, anything that's occurring. Yeah, super helpful. Yeah, because I I would want to know like what to go to as a resource to you know, that you can kind of rely on. And so it's good to hear that they do independent research and from the CPA's perspective. Yeah, definitely not social media. Definitely <laughs> not. I don't know. The news channels, isn't they all, aren't they all consolidated under one ownership pretty much nowadays? But yeah, so nonprofits or things that are not controlled by one party. That's a great point because I think our kids get their latest news from TikTok <laughs> these days. So yeah, we really got to be careful. So mm -hmm. let's kind of shift gears to the NAR new practice changes. So it's been in the news. There's a lot of confusion. And basically, it was a, as a result of the NAR commission mm -hmm. lawsuit. So it mm -hmm. started in Hawaii just last week on August 12th, nationwide on August 17th. And basically, as a result of the settlement, two things came out. Number one is that on the multiple listing services where all the realtors have access to, the commission amount could no longer be posted, whether it's two and a half percent or three percent, it's no longer on the MLS. And then number two, going forward, any buyer who's going to engage the services of a realtor have to sign a buyer's representation contract. And on the buyer's rep contract, as we call it, you have to kind of agree to the amount of time that you'll be engaged in the services of the realtor. And number two is how much commission, either the amount or percentage of the sales price, which they're gonna be obligated to pay. So I know we were talking about earlier and pretty much on the seller side, on paper, it's the, the commissions for both agents have always been paid out of the seller's proceeds when they mm -hmm. disperse the money. In reality, the buyers, all that money to pay for the agents, to pay the seller have always come from the buyers. So from a kind of like a the new practice changes and from your tax perspective, um, how do you see this impacting either the sellers or the buyers? Okay, that's a great question. And um, and so as I mentioned, I do a lot of HARPTA filings. Um, one of the type of filings is a HARPTA waiver, where before closing, we request the tax office the tax office to determine that there's not going to be any taxable gain on sale. And what we use to determine the reduction on the gain is the um, cost from the seller's the closing statement. And on a closing statement right now, the seller pays for, as you mentioned, the listing agent commission, as well as the buyer's agent commission. And so for right now with the HARPTA waivers, we get that the sellers get two huge deductions from their gain calculation of those commissions. But now if the seller is not automatically liable for the buyer's agent's commissions, they no longer will have that as an expense to deduct for their harp the waiver. And you know, we're talking depending on the size of, of the property, you know, it's tens of thousands of dollars that you are talking about to the, to reduce your taxable gain. And so in that situations where it can be that the seller no longer can apply for a HAPTA waiver because they don't have that buyer's commission payment or obligation to reduce their gain. And so they would have taxable gain and they could not apply for a HAPTA waiver. However, 
after closing, they can reply, they can apply for a Harta early refund. And we've helped hundreds of clients do that. But if the seller is selling their home and you know they they need Harta assistance and they do choose to offer a buyer's agency commission, then they still can claim that deduction. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yes. If they still pay that amount, you can still include it on the on the seller's closing statement as their deduction and take that. Correct. Okay. So it's only if they opt not to and they and then they are subject to hard to withholding and then they're unable to, <laughs> to sort of pad it, but then they can always, you know, claim after closing, like you said, and then you can help them to get get their early refund. Yeah, yeah they're early refund. Her. Okay. Mm -hmm. Side. Seems like, you know, this past week, there's been a lot of activity. And at least from our experience in talking to our fellow colleagues in the real estate industry, it's still status quo, meaning that the commissions, you know, it, it's always going to be negotiated as part of the offer. And then uh, I think for the most part, I mean, I haven't seen anyone who says the seller are, are not paying the the commission so we'll see how it goes so it might be status quo for majority of the transactions but it'll be interesting to see how everything evolves over the next six to 12 months yeah that yeah it would definitely be good to always watch out for and again for the heart to waiver for each individual client we can always do a consultation and do an estimated calculation of whether they can qualify for a waiver a reduction or the early refund is the only option but yeah, yeah, it's it's just like taxes. You have to keep monitoring changes to the law and figuring out what you need to do. Do you know, Tabitha, when did HARPTA start? Like, was that since, like, from when? Oh, a long time ago. <laughs> I think before, <laughs> before mm -hmm. I was alive. But, but the thing is, is that I think we've only been hearing more about it recently because I mean, I've actually had personal experience, and that's why I started looking into this, the Harpda, is because I had a friend's family member visit, and they were talking about their closing and stuff like that. And so, you know me, I'm always asked a lot of questions. And so I found out that she actually got Harpda withheld during closing, but she had like no idea. She like is from Texas. So she had like no idea that it's only a withholding and that they can actually get that money back by filing a Hawaii income tax return. So HAPTA actually is where the state of Hawaii were tired of people running away with their tax money. And they're like, hold on, tax you first at the maximum amount, a 7.25% maximum tax, assuming you have nothing, like no basis. And so they take all that money first and they say, it's up to you to prove that I took way too much of my share of your money. And so that's why taxpayers have to be like a lot of people that don't live in Hawaii, they need, they need, and even some people that do live in Hawaii, if they don't have the situation, they're not aware that it's, you can, there are ways to get that money back. Because if you don't tell them, if you don't prove that they took your money for no reason, you only have two years to get that money back. So after two years, tax office is like, yep, close another deal, 100, that they don't have they took all this money from you without you asking for it back. And so it becomes theirs. Yeah, it's really important just to be aware of this other tax that you have to know about what's a withholding, but that you have a ways to actually get that money back from your estimated taxes. You know, we talked about buy, buying versus renting, all the benefits. We talked about Harkta, a little bit of some political stuff, the landscape, you know, what, what's coming up for 2025. Any last words that you would like to share with the viewers and how, how do they reach out to you? Oh, yeah. So I, um, HawaiiTaxFilings.com. I have my website, all of, a lot of information up there, as well as my phone number, um, email, text, call, whichever way you want to reach out to me, your comfort zone. I definitely would love to discuss any situation that you may have. Um, and yes, anything relating to HARPTA filings or Hawaii taxes, you know, you can go ahead and bounce anything off of me and I'll be more than happy to assist. I just want to talk one more thing about um, renting versus buying. I just want to put one more point for the home ownership side. So in addition to home ownership while you live, you also have the ability to leave it as a legacy for your kids. 
And I think you guys had a um, had a show with Julie from Old Republic Title, and she talks about 1031 exchanges. So I'm not going to talk about it here, but that was a really good video. Um, so during the lifetime, you can do 1031 exchanges and defer taxes. And then you can, when you pass on, you can then leave that amount to your children. And because you leave it to your beneficiaries without selling it, they actually, as beneficiaries, get a step up in their basis, 100%. So you defer your taxes while you're living by doing 1031 exchange. And then when you die, um, long, long, long time from now, your beneficiaries will also not have to pay any taxes if your estate tax exemption is more than the value of your estate. And that's another thing for, um, for the Tax Cuts and Job Act. It actually doubled the standard deduction, but it also doubled estate tax exemption. So right now it's $13.6 million. So if your estate is less than $13.6 million, then you're in the clear because estate tax is the most expensive tax you will ever have to pay. It's like takes like a quarter of any value of your estate. But um, but another thing is, is that in, if it expires in 2025, that's going to go back down to about $7 million in estate tax exemption. So just another thing to be aware of for home ownership. You get that legacy, you give it to your beneficiaries, and possibly they nobody pays taxes on it. Yeah, if you set it up correctly. Thank you so much, Tabitha, for spending time with us today and for being our very special guest. Thank you so much. I, I can't believe the 30 minutes went by so fast. But I also just want to do the quick disclaimer in terms of like all the examples that I use were for simplified general. And but I would be more than happy to discuss any custom situations that you can then use as tax advice because everything that I mentioned now is just for educational purposes. But thank you so much. Aloha, Kavita. Aloha.